Hi, this is Bronwyn Keith Hines, and you're listening to Bluegrass Jam Along, the podcast for anyone and everyone who plays bluegrass. So my guest this week on the podcast is Bronwyn Keith Hines, who you might know from Mile 12, you might know from her solo record, Fiddler's Pastime, you might know from Molly Tuttle's new band, um, She's been Winfield Fiddle Champion, IBMA Momentum Instrumentalist of the Year, and is the current IBMA Fiddle Player of the Year as well. Bronwyn, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Um, Bronwyn is a Welsh name, is that right? Yeah, it is. It is. I don't have any Welsh family. I think my <laughs> family just liked the name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I read you, um, you're sort of first generation Irish American father and then a Southern American mother. So there's a, a good mix mm-hmm. for a fiddler. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and so you began playing pretty young by the sound of it. Yeah, I started when I was three and just kind of fell into fiddling. I guess I, I saw some girls playing on the street when I was when I was that little and um, you know, asked my parents for violin lessons and just kind of been doing it as long as I can remember. Um, but yeah, my family would take trips to Ireland a lot when I was a kid to visit relatives and you know, I got to hear a lot of the traditional music over there. And that's kind of the first sort of fiddling I got into when I was a kid. Um, So I did that for a long time before I before I discovered bluegrass. Was there a particular sort of moment you remember for discovering bluegrass? Or was it just something that was around more when you were older? Yeah, I think the first moment I really remember hearing it was at some fiddle camps um, that I went to when I was maybe 15 or so. And some some of the kids that I, I was friends with had, had kind of discovered it a little bit ahead of me and were starting to play it a little bit. And I just remember, you know, hearing kind of the bluesy sound of it and just being totally, mm. totally into that sound. And just like, what is that? That's so different from, from the Celtic fiddling that I, that I started out with. So, And yeah. I guess sort of opens up a whole new world of, um, well, improvisation for one, because the Celtic tradition is pretty similar to the old time, tradition in the states where people just tend to play the melody um, and there's ornamentation and lots of stylistic stuff going on but there's a lot less improvisation than you find in bluegrass so that must have been an eye-opener yeah totally and just like kind of really exciting you know you're a teenager and you're trying to express yourself and feeling misunderstood and you know (laughs) improvisation bluesy improvisation feels like a great outlet (laughs) yeah yeah totally um and and so what I'd like really excited to talk about is your album Fiddler's Pastime, which cool. has been on repeat play in this house for quite a while now and oh, wow. is an absolute favourite. But it's a really interesting mix. Um, you know, traditionally, somebody brings out their own record and you get a, an instrumentalist doing an instrumental record or you get a singer doing a record full of songs or you might get a mix of the two. Um, and this feels, I don't know if it's like, unusual, but it, it's it sort of shows all facets of fiddle playing from you taking the lead to you sort of taking a supporting role in the background. And it's fascinating to hear that because it's not necessarily a record you would put on and go, this is absolutely a fiddle record. It's just a music record full of great stuff that features fiddle throughout, but it's not, um, it's not sort of fiddle in your face throughout, is it? Yeah, totally. Yeah. I, yeah, I guess I wanted to make a record where I did everything I like to do on the fiddle. Yeah. Which includes, you know, playing fiddle tunes and playing song tunes I've written and also backing up singers. And I mean, I think there's, there's definitely some fiddle records that were an inspiration for that sort of thing. Um, Aubrey Haney has put out, I guess his first record, um, doing my time was, I think, you know, kind of a big influence. And that had a couple guest singers on there where he's just backing them up and, um, Mike, some of Michael Cleveland's records, you know, have some guest singers. So I guess I was trying to go for a record kind of in that vein. Yeah. Yeah. And it's great because there's so much variety on there, not just in terms of sort of the material, the songs are different, the tunes are different, but in terms of the textures as well, there's full band stuff. There's, you know, duets, there's a trio, there's, you know, it's got a bit of everything and it's great. Um, it's just a really nice mix to listen to. Um, and I'm sort of curious how that disparate mix of stuff sort of started to form as an album. Cause I remember sort of reading somewhere, um, there was a particular tune that was the first one that sort of kicked the album off really. You sort of mm. had one tune and that was the seed of everything. And I wondered how it all sort of came together around that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. The first tune I wrote for the album was that tune, um, called Open Water. And it's like this fast G minor tune. It's kind of right, trying to write a tune in the style of like Ronnie McCurry. He's got all those great, 
um, kind of modal, really fast, bluegrassy sounding tunes with yeah, yeah. maybe more than two parts. This one has like three and a bit parts. And, um, you know, so it's definitely kind of trying to go for that. I, I remember I was um, like hanging out at IBMA. Oh, it would be like IBMA 2019, I guess. And um, I had some free time. And I think I'd already kind of started thinking that I might want to do an album, but, you know, I just didn't really know where to start. And I was just trying to noodle around and write some tunes maybe you know maybe write something i would like enough to to think about recording it and yeah i was sitting in a stairwell and i got i wrote the a part of that tune there and that um that features sierra hole that particular tune on the album um yeah yeah i wanted you know i wanted mandolin and fiddle unison on that one yeah yeah um and i did that at that point did you sort of have an album in mind or was it a case of i've got a tune I'll just sort of collect some more and see how it goes. Or did you have an idea for a project at that stage? I think pretty soon after that, I had an idea for a project. Um, I was really nervous to make something, you know, it was the first, it was my first record I'd ever made on my own. And, you know, that's, I don't know, maybe for some people it's easy, but for me, it was really, really hard to gather the confidence to be like, I'm ready to do this. And like this, the world needs this, you know, it's like, it's hard to feel that way. I think for me, Um, but uh, yeah, I, I remember I talked to um, talked to Wes Corbett, who who produced the album. He's a great banjo player. He's played with a number of bands over the years, but most recently plays with the Sam Bush Band. And um, he's been a friend for a long time. We were roommates a little bit. He let me live at his house when I first moved to Nashville, which was very nice. And has just been a really kind of supportive um, presence in my life and, you know, kind of nurturing and just really, really cool musical figure. So I kind of felt like if anyone would help give me confidence and support me through that process, it would be him. So I remember sitting down with him and being like, well, I want to make an album and I have one tune. <laughs> and he was like, cool, let's go write some more. <laughs> you know, let's, you know, we just kind of talked about what, what I wanted out of the album that I wanted it to be a mixture of um, original things, a few traditional tunes and, and some guest singers. And we just started brainstorming. And I think we, um, you know, we kind of talked about people that I've had a musical connection with or in some way over the years and, you know, people that might just be a cool, um, cool addition to the record. So, you know, once we started asking people, I think that kind of also informed the direction of like, um, some of the songs to choose. Yeah, I had um, I had Wes on the podcast uh, a couple of months ago, and he was talking about the process he went through, sort of doing mm -hmm. his record with Chris Eldridge producing, and uh, yeah. it's, uh, that production side of recording is a fascinating thing because it it sounds like the sort of the production side of it almost started before there was a record to produce. That Wes was sort of involved in the the whole process. Definitely, yeah, I would take him. He helped, like you know, I kind of gave him um, co writing credit on all the tunes because uh, he was really helpful with those. Um, I came up with kind of all the melodies but he came up with a lot of the the chords for the tunes which really you know changed the way they sounded and it was just a great you know we'd we'd just kind of go over my tunes and he'd be like oh i like that one not that one you know add this to this one that kind of thing so that was really helpful it's amazing what you can what you can do with the harmonization of a tune isn't it you can totally change the nature of a melody by what you put yeah absolutely it. it completely completely changes it Cool. And so, I mean, you've got some great people on this record and also some great people putting in great performances. Like Sarah Jarose is just a, an amazing singer and she mm. absolutely turned up for this one. Yeah. <laughs> so, was so, such, a, yeah. such a cool version of Last Train. <laughs> oh, it's so nice of her to sing on it. Yeah, it's totally awesome. I, you know, I'm a huge fan of her singing and, and I love it when she sings bluegrass too. So it's cool to have her do something kind of traditional sounding. I'd, um, I'd never heard, actually heard her sing in person until earlier this year she came over to the uk on transatlantic sessions tour and then um, mm. just you know i knew she was a great singer but hearing that from sort of 15 feet away you know is is a thing <laughs> yeah for sure oh my gosh i remember um like we were in school together kind of at the same time up in boston she was going to new england conservatory and i was going to berkeley um so you know we'd end up at a lot of parties and jams together and stuff and yeah it's just you know when you hear somebody sing like that just so flawlessly up close it's yeah it's really incredible and it's a it's a real um really interesting mix of voices on the record as well because you've got tim o'brien on there who's you know tim is i mean tim's tim he's one of the one of these singers he's got such an amazing voice um and yeah 
uh, but also hearing him sing um, with James Key, who I didn't know before this, and I sort of did a little yeah. bit of research and sort of heard you talking about how he's one of your favourite musicians that you, you met when you moved to Nashville, um, and he's got a great voice. Yeah, yeah, James is awesome. James is so multi talented, and yeah, he's kind of real pillar of like the Nashville um, Nashville music scene these days. He's got this band East Nash Grass that plays at um, Dee's Lounge, which is about a mile from my house here in Madison. And they play every Monday night and it's just like, you know, some of the best trad bluegrass you'd ever hear. And, and they're starting to play national gigs. I think they're playing like romp festival this year and some other stuff. So yeah, it's great. Cool. And, um, and Chris Eldridge sings on the record as well. And we don't, I don't get to hear Chris sing a lot, but he's got an amazing voice. It's so, um, it's so sort of direct particularly on quiet songs. Yeah. Like there's a, a song, he, an Eddie Vedder song he recorded with Julian Large called Sleeping By Myself. And when he sings those quiet tunes, there's, there's sort of something unadorned and incredibly moving about it. We'll be right back with you just after this. Bluegrass Jam Along is proud to be sponsored by Collings Guitars and Mandolins. If you're attending the NAMM show in January, stop by the Collings booth to say hello to the team, get hands-on with their selection of customised acoustics and electrics, and check out some exciting new prototypes they're working on for 2024. They'll also have a few of their world-class artists on hand demoing various instruments. And if you can't attend, don't forget to follow their Instagram and Facebook accounts throughout the show for photos, videos, and the latest news. Collings guitars are hand-built from the sound up in Austin, Texas. This episode is also brought to you by Peghead Nation, the home of Roots Music Instruction. If one of your 2024 resolutions is to improve as a musician, Peghead Nation is the place to go. They have 65 streaming video courses for guitar, mandolin, banjo, fiddle, dobro, bass and ukulele from some of the leading names in acoustic music. Courses cover bluegrass, old time, Irish music and swing, plus lessons dedicated to improvisation, theory and ear training. Your first course is just $20 a month and you can add more for $10. Try any course free for a month with the promo code JAMALONG. Make 2024 a year of more music at pegheadnation.com. Yeah, I love the way he sings. It's so, like, pure. Um, Yeah, I want him to do, like, a bluegrass record. I hope that's going to happen at some point. I'm sure it will. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's got such a cool voice. And particularly that track being such a a sort of stripped back track. It's just the three of you, isn't it? It's just fiddle, guitar and and bass. Yeah. He Um, totally, like, reimagined that. I wasn't, I didn't, I think I was thinking that was just going to be another full band kind of bluegrassy cut because that's kind of how John Hartford did it. But, yeah, and then Chris texted me this, like, stripped down, like, finger style version (laughs) and I was very confused for a second and then like loved it you know it's it's just not what I had and then Wes kept saying that had to be like a trio and stripped down and I was like oh no that's so exposed (laughs) but I think it turned out nice yeah it's beautiful and it just um sort of coming where it does in the record as well just before the end it sort of takes things down again a little bit and it's just it just it's like a breath in the middle of stuff you know a lovely lovely dynamic to it um yeah um, and the band that you've got, so you've got various people coming and playing on individual tracks, but you've got a core band for the record. Um, could you talk us through sort of how they ended up being your core band for this? There's a really interesting mix of people there. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So like Jake Stargell um, played guitar and um, Jeff Picker on bass and Harry Clark was on mandolin and, and Wes played banjo. And I mean, I think all of those guys are people I've known for a long time and just like loved jamming with. Um First time Jeff Picker plays with Ricky Skaggs, um, but the first time I met him, he was playing bass. It's probably about 10 years ago, and we were both on a kind of a pickup gig together, and I didn't even, or he was playing guitar the first time I met him, and I didn't even know he played bass. Um, but yeah, he's just, I don't know, just a great, a great guy. And same with Jake. We've just been kind of jamming together, and same with Harry. Um, I think I just wanted to pick people that I, that I loved their playing, and that I'd feel comfortable with, you know, people that I'm friends with, you know, there's, I could have, you know, could have called um, people that I didn't know. There's, you know, a million people to call in Nashville, but I wanted to, wanted to play pe- with people that I was comfortable with and, and loved their playing. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's one of the cool things about listening to a record like this or, or like Wes's record or anybody's record when, when they're 
curated the people on it a bit you you know people are chosen for their sound or their dynamic or or whatever mm-hmm. it is and hearing sort of and you know the so sort of ultimate example of that recently is Bela Flex recent yeah. record of you know so many different groups of people <laughs> he's put together and just hearing people in different contexts with each other definitely it's, it's yeah really Jake and Harry Jake and Harry both kind of have this thing with their playing where it's I mean, they're just monster improvisers. So every, like every solo is great and every solo is different. And like, even sometimes just a totally different approach, which is just like so interesting and like inspiring to play with. Um, Yeah, they're just, I don't know. They're really kind of just natural feel players. So it's, yeah, I think they both brought something really special to the project. And I guess if they're all people that you're used to jamming with sort of around Nashville, then that's a very different, uh, different sort of feel to people you're used to playing sessions with or you know if you're used to being able to to play and explore stuff together then it must give you maybe a sort of shared um I, the musical experiences are always really cool when you've got a certain shared communication that doesn't need anything saying somebody mm-hmm. just goes somewhere and everybody else follows and you know that that must must help to have jammed quite a bit before that yeah, definitely. And, you know, sometimes like some of my favorite musical moments I've had have just been in jams, you know, and they, they're never captured and you never you never really know if it was as cool as you thought it was or what. But so but then, you know, you kind of bring people together that you have jammed with a lot and then you put them in the studio and you capture it. It's it's a pretty cool thing. Yeah. And that's there's something about um, like a, any sort of recording is is a snapshot. It's like a yeah. You know, it's a it's a it's a record of what those songs sounded like on that day, and it, particularly yeah, if you've got people totally. who will improvise and go off in any direction, they could have sounded totally different the next day, or if you'd had a break and come back two weeks mm-hmm. later, and you may have ended up with a different yeah. record, you know, completely. <laughs> totally, yeah, it's funny. <laughs> yeah, um, there's a track on the record called "The Minstrel Boy" that, that Tim O'Brien sings. Um, yeah. And I read I read some of the notes that you put up about it. So it's a new melody that Tim wrote to a poem from the 1800s. Uh, did yeah. he write it for this record? I don't think so. No, I think he had it kind of in a drafts folder of, I think he had just a folder of material and he was, you know, I asked him if he had anything in mind that he'd want to, I think I threw a couple ideas at him, but I wasn't, it's pretty, it's pretty hard to pick a tune for Tim O'Brien to sing on your album. It's a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of pressure. So I was definitely like left the door open if he had something in mind and, I was, yeah, super, I don't know. I thought it was really cool that he would, you know, be willing to use something like that on my record um, instead of saving it for, you know, something he was going to do. But yeah, it was really nice of him. And it turned out so cool. I lo- that's like one of my favorite tracks. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, and maybe that's the thing with Tim O'Brien. He's so prolific and has covered so much ground in his time that maybe you're just not precious about saving the best stuff when you've got so much stuff. I remember I saw him in London years ago yeah. and went up and requested a particular song. He went, oh, I don't remember that one. That was years ago. <laughs> you know, right, really. yeah. for Gosh, me, that's one of my so favorite Tim O'Brien records. songs. Yeah. Right. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. And um, listen to an interview with you chatting a while ago and you were, you were talking about um, the process of making a record almost as a learning experience and as a, a sort of way of improving because you were sort of saying you know earlier on um, the idea of you know why why does the world need to hear this and generally with any any art it comes from the artist needing to hear it doesn't it and needing to do it and and then mm-hmm. hopefully the world likes it too um but yeah i found it really interesting the idea that you almost make a record to to learn something about your playing and learn about yourself yeah definitely it was a huge it's always a huge eye opener every time I make an album you know I made a couple with a couple full length ones with mile 12 and I've been a part of a few you know other projects um yeah and then yeah gosh making my own was was definitely next level in terms of learning you know you learn things (laughs) anywhere from like specific notes that you tend to play out of tune to like you know what it's what it's going to sound like when certain people play something together for the first time and and it's different than what you thought it was going to be or anything. Yeah. It's, it's pretty cool. I, yeah, I want to make another one. (laughs) And was it, was it different sort of being your own record in terms of obviously you've got Wes there producing it and somebody else is listening during the takes for stuff. Are you able Mm -hmm. to just, just play at those moments or you still sort of got, got a slight, production head on yourself and you're listening to everybody else and or can you just lose yourself and, and just get on with the, the song in that moment I think I was pretty just kind of going for it you know I 
think it would have been too much to be trying to listen to listen to everything with a kind of a critical ear. And I feel like the more critical I get in the studio, the worse stuff turns out in terms of, you know, you kind of you get that other side of your brain. That's that's not the creative side, a little too active. And then it's um, it's hard to hard to be spontaneous and stuff. So I think I, as much as possible, I was trying to just focus on playing. And I, you know, I knew I trusted everyone in there, musicians and producer and um, Ben, the engineer, and I had a friend taking notes and, you know, I felt like it was in good hands. So I just kind of went for it. But um, yeah. And then, um, yeah, my friend Carolyn, who's a fiddle, great fiddler was taking notes and she would kind of help us narrow down the takes. She'd be like, okay, well, like these three were, these three were good takes. So like, then go back and listen to those. And then you kind of, you don't have to choose from all 10 takes or whatever, yeah. however many you did. <laughs> and did it, um, did it feel different from making a mile 12 record? I don't know how much yeah. you sort of, did you write much material for mile 12? Hardly any, if any, did I, I don't think I wrote anything. I mean, I, well, maybe I, I co-wrote on one song, but yeah, almost nothing. So I felt like with mile 12, it was very, you know, um, you're, everyone's bringing their piece of it, you know, and I'm in charge of the fiddling and, you know, Evan's in charge of the singing and et cetera. So it's, it's super five people deciding on everything, which is kind of really comforting in a way. It's really nice to have, um, you know, four other people to help make a decision on everything. Um, it's a little different, but thankful, you know, I guess that's why you get a producer when you make a, a solo project oftentimes. So you have at least one other person to bounce things off of. But, yeah, totally. It's often hard to know yeah. what your what your best stuff is yourself. You know, in any form of mm -hmm. creation, you're so bound up in it. It's it's always interesting to hear other people's opinions because often the the ones they pick out as the best takes aren't the ones that felt like the best takes. Or you know, yeah, it's like you. Everyone has their own certain things that they're listening for, and hopefully, like you know, a good producer is more listening to the whole ensemble rather than you know. I, I'm sure I can get really wrapped up in just hearing, listening for the fiddle and you know, not hear everything else quite as clearly. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and you were saying yeah. just then that you obviously got a taste for this and you'd like to make another record. Yeah, definitely. I've been thinking about that a lot, um, a lot this year, I'm starting to gather some material for it. So, And is it, I guess, I guess it's a difficult record to, to go out and tour with, just in terms yeah, of schedule, was... schedules and... Yeah, that was the one thing about that record that I kind of realized. I don't think I, well, I, I mean, I knew, I guess I knew going into it that it wouldn't be the kind of record you could, even doing like one show on that record is would not be the easiest thing. I mean, it, I put it out during COVID, so there, there was that. But like, even so, you know, having that many different, like, very well-known guest vocalists who would be very busy and trying to like get all those people together on the same day for an album release show, it would just like be a nightmare scheduling. So I think the next record that I make, I think I want it to be more, more centered around music that I could perform with different ensembles and different bands, whoever was available. Um, mm. So if there were, if, yeah. So I'm planning on singing on a, singing on the next record and yeah, just kind of have it be something I could actually do more shows with down the road. That'd be cool. Um, and mm -hmm. so was, the album was, you finished all recording pre COVID then presumably. Yeah, it was like right before I probably did the last session. Like, I last overdub session was like early March. So oh wow! <laughs> snuck it in. Yeah, it's crazy. Cool. And um, yeah. and sort of you know things have taken off since then. Obviously, there was there was no touring or playing for a while. Um, mm -hmm. But suddenly you're kind of everywhere with Molly Tuttle. Yeah, that's been so fun. I mean, gosh, what a what a crazy turn of events um I you know I don't think if you'd asked me a year, a year ago I would have had no idea that this is where I would be and what I would be doing now but I'm really grateful for it and it's it's such a fun band to be a part of it's you know it's total dream band it's funny because um obviously been over in the UK you guys haven't played here but just seeing the photos and the videos on social media like it looks like you are having the most fun yeah, I feel like I'm I like can't stop smiling on stage because there's just always something or multiple awesome things happening and just trying to like soak it all in and like, you know, enjoy it. 
It feels like, um, and this might just be me talking sort of from personal experience, but having a couple of years of no live music and now there being live music, everybody seems to so sort of pumped for it um, and so excited about. And and just sort of watching a couple of people who who were sort of there or thereabouts along the way before the pandemic just take off since, like Molly being one, you know, it's just it feels like for this sure. record is just, and Billy Strings kind of that's just yeah skyrocketing as well and it feels like a part of that is just that people are so up for a good live show now yeah totally so like hungry for it and I think the musicians are probably the feeling the same way of just like you know I kind of had all this pent-up energy and like anxiety and you know there's so many worries and thoughts of like oh am I ever going to be able to tour again or perform again like is you know kind of really crazy stuff to have to think about after, you know, devoting your entire life to something. So then when you're finally able to go back and out and do it, I feel like I'm, I'm giving it like everything I've got because I'm, I'm just so happy to be there. So what were you doing for those two years? What, like, I mean, obviously it wasn't the whole two years, but the first chunk of it, there can't have been much to do. So how are you keeping busy? Yeah, the first year. Yeah, I guess it was a whole first year of not, not really performing a lot of practicing I mean I, I feel like it definitely definitely got a lot of practicing in that I wouldn't really have had time for otherwise I dug really dug really hard into like early bluegrass stuff learning a lot of fiddle breaks from Bill Monroe and Flatten and Scruggs and then bluegrass album band stuff I think one of my goals was like to learn every Bobby Hicks solo on <laughs> all the bluegrass album band records so I did that and um yeah so stuff like that um a lot of like outdoor activities. I got to know the parks of Nashville very well and did some fishing and taught a lot of lessons too. Like I had a lot of, a lot of fiddle students. I think it was a kind of a cool way for everyone to connect with, you know, connect and have something to do and gave me purpose and gave them purpose. And that was a yeah. cool thing. Yeah. I, I'm part of the artist works program on Brian Sutton's course and Chris Eldridge's course actually. And just oh, like cool. seeing how many people sort of, joined that over just from being at home and and it's sort of how this podcast came out really I was at home with nothing to do and nobody to play with and Mm -hmm. just found myself picking up the guitar more and more and having time to play it and wanting an outlet for that that there wasn't one I couldn't go anywhere so just finding a way of of putting something out and and connecting with people in some form yeah for sure I, I feel like I spent so much more time on social media and like put more way more effort into social media because it was like it felt like more real all of a sudden it's like literally the only way I'm seeing my friends and connecting and sharing you know so I would start to do a lot of videos and you know which is cool it, you know my Instagram account grew so I guess that's something and it was otherwise really interesting time just from like somebody on the the other side of that um just seeing like people being very, really visible and seeing so much content from people, that, but it wasn't a record or a live show or it might be somebody just playing a fiddle tune in their kitchen or like just the amount of um, sort of contacts like you and, and the, a different side of people as well. You might see somebody playing a fiddle tune who, you know, on their records don't play fiddle tunes or, and, and okay. seeing a much more casual kind of music making from people was really enjoyable. Yeah, definitely. I remember one time, like, you know, it's just like one night pretty early on in the pandemic, just going on. I don't know if it was Facebook or Instagram, but there was just like live stream after live, like everyone was live. And I was just like going through watching my friends all be playing music. It was kind of cool. It just felt like the party was the party was right there, I guess, in a weird way. Yeah. And it is amazing yeah. how much um, just how much you can say even. And I think some of those those things have have continued like there's so much more streamed live music now as well and to be able to Mm -hmm. watch a gig you know i live in the uk a lot of the the tours don't happen over here and there's a lot of stuff goes on at the the u.s festivals that we don't get to see and to be able to you know spend a a few pounds and watch some of these shows is amazing and i think that's one of the positive things that's come out of it is there's now a way of beaming these things around the world yeah definitely i think that's that's definitely true and even more, um, like, you know, people are more and more into, like, virtual lessons as well. You know, I don't think that's stopped since things have opened up. People are still really open to doing that, which is cool. And are you, are you still busy teaching as well? Yeah, a little bit. I'm, I'm trying to, it's, it's, I'm trying to balance it with the touring. The touring has been pretty, pretty nonstop, but I'm, I'm teaching a little bit here and there, but it's, it's not very much these days. 
and I guess festival season is kicking in. So that's going to yeah, keep you busy gonna... over summer. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And what sort of um, what what's ahead? Obviously, you'd like to know the record. Have you got a sense of what that's going to be yet? Oh, for the next one. Yeah. Mm, well, I'm. I'd like to sing on it. I've been been working a lot on my singing last couple of years at home. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of that's kind of where I'm at with that for the most part. I've just been kind of gathering material, um, but yeah, I'm not not too not too sure about the specifics yet. And does the um, sort of Molly Tottenham Golden Highway feel like an ongoing thing now? Is that mm-hmm. is that sort of a project or is that like a band now? Um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely, definitely her, you know, her project. Um, yeah, it's looking like it's going to keep going for a while. Um, so that's, that's really exciting because it feels like we're, we're building something really cool and, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna be awesome to be able to come back to, come back to cities we've already played and, you know, maybe play a bigger venue or play to even more people and, you know, hit even more festivals. So yeah, it's, it's really fun. Cool. Um, I think one of the really interesting things, it, just sort of reading the stuff on your site and reading some of the stuff about the record, um, one is the sort of sense of like on the record. There's a there's a line in the um, I think it's on your website that talks about slipping into the background in creative ways to support other instruments and guest singers, um, but also hearing you talk about winning the IBMA Fiddle Player of the Year and talking about made you want to work harder to feel like you'd earned it and and like those two things just really struck a chord in my head and the the sense of like a total lack of um like not ego is the wrong word but just such a like a humility of okay that's good what's next then um and it's it's something that's really struck me in the bluegrass world that like and just how collaborative things are as well just how much people are prepared to back somebody else up even if they are a name themselves or have their own career or front their own band. Um, you just don't get it in the rock and pop world where uh, maybe that's down to money and record companies and contracts and also, but just the cross pollination of stuff. Yeah. Like, as somebody coming into this scene, it's remarkable. Totally. And I mean, cause I feel like anyone who's really into bluegrass and like, you know, is into, is into their instruments role, you know, like I'm so Mm. excited about the way Bobby Hicks plays back up to Tony Rice, you know, and his little fills. Like, I think that's the coolest stuff. So to have the chance to like try to do something like that with someone like Molly or, you know, to that's just as exciting to me as, you know, playing uh, like a, like a fiddle tune all by myself, you know, like, I don't know. I think just like, and I think everyone is just like really into their instruments role in general. Um, so it's a cool thing about bluegrass. Yeah. And those, those roles like on the face of it are, you sort of look at people regularly describe a bluegrass band as being like a drum kit, you know, and the bass is the bass drum and the mandolin is the snare drum. And, and that all makes total sense. But then you hear a range of different bands and they all interpret that slightly differently. So the way Punch Brothers function as a unit is very different to the way that, you know, Mile 12 functions as a unit or, you know, they're, they're very, People, people take that and can take it to all sorts of places. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I mean, gosh, people like Punch Brothers, you know, have taken it to the extreme of, you know, transcribing parts from other instruments and, you know, all their cool pop covers that, you know, they're they're playing different parts um, that weren't even necessarily meant to be bluegrass instrument parts for starters, which is which is really cool. Yeah, and that, that you're just saying, sort of talking about um, to sort of, Filling, putting fills in around things as well and that sense of when you hear I don't know Stuart Duncan or Jerry Douglas do something like that you realize what an art form that is in its own right compared to mm-hmm. you know just the the nuance and the ability to come in with one or two phrases and a little gap and you know yeah totally I mean things. I think that's like yeah that I feel like that can be like the hardest thing I mean it's all hard but that you know that that's definitely an art form and I feel like that's the thing like my fiddle students have the most questions about is, is playing backup. Cause it's, um, it's just less obvious. It's like a little less, it's like harder to explain, right? You can explain how to make a solo and what to play and you play the melody with some licks. Right. Yeah. But then, yeah. Well, then also from the, like, you know, fiddle is I played guitar and I played mandolin and I understand how those sort of function and playing backup as a guitarist in a bluegrass band, like there's lots of ways you can do it, but it's pretty straightforward 
there's a pretty straightforward role you've got. And as a mandolin player, so, but as a fiddle player, if the mandolin's got the chop going on and banjo's sort of rolling around everything, where where you fit in while people are singing and other things are going on must be a real sort of a real thing to learn. Totally, yeah. And I mean, there's so many different approaches even within that. You know, there's, there's people like Bobby Hicks and Pastor Clements who who would play pretty busy and you know play really a, a lot of stuff under the under the singer. And then there's you know there's other folks. Stuart would probably you know seems like he's a little bit more spacious with his backup in general. But you know, but then it depends on the style that he's going for and who he's playing with and all that. It's, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. It feels kind of never ending. And who were the who were the players that first sort of caught your ear when you started listening to bluegrass? Was there was there anybody that that made you really sit up and listen? Um, I think the first the first bluegrass fiddle that I heard and was super excited about was Casey Dreesen. I remember hearing his um, version of Jerusalem Ridge, uh, and like yeah, I thought that was the coolest thing. But yeah, but then after that, definitely hearing like Michael Cleveland and um, Stewart. Aubrey Haney, Jason Carter, Allison Krauss. I think like that kind of that generation of fiddlers was really what got me into it. And, and after that, then I kind of dug back into, into the older stuff. It took me a little longer to, to listen to that stuff. Yeah. There's some in there's so much now there's, there's a, a lifetime's work just listening to the old stuff and there's so much exciting. It feels like um, there's a real, it's a really exciting period for bluegrass and acoustic music in general, but bluegrass feels like it's got a real energized thing going through it right now. There's so much exciting and disparate stuff going on. Yeah, it really does. I mean, it feels like, yeah, you see people like Queen Sky Bluegrass and Billy Strings being able to play to crowds that large and play bluegrass and play trad bluegrass. It's, it's awesome, you know, to, I don't know, I guess be able to kind of harness the, like the jam band, um, audience as well as the bluegrass audience and the Americana audience to some degree and the country audience and like yeah somehow it seems like all of those people are potential fans of bluegrass you know it's just it's just getting the music to them in a way that that's going to appeal to them and I think I think Molly definitely does that really well as well so it's it's pretty cool yeah and I remember Sarah Watkins talking about you know, Nickel Creek going through that thing I think they you know they really benefited from the old brother surge of interest mm-hmm. um you know if, if, if you, i remember them sort of saying if you had one bluegrass album that year it was old brother if you had two it was that in nickel creek and um yeah you know they brought a huge audience to bluegrass as well and it's it's really interesting to see how people respond to that and you know some people really don't like it and some people love it and some people don't care either way as long as the music's good and um and just sit like the variety i went to see billy strings in march he played over in Europe for the first time. And I saw him on a Friday mm-hmm. night in a record store with about 300 people in it. And they finished the set around one mic and it was like a really, you know, pretty low key, pretty trad. And then I saw him two nights later, lift the roof off a theater with full on, you know, the, and, and the variety just within that was mm-hmm. extraordinary. Like the same band, two nights apart, entirely different set, entirely different vibe. And, you know, but essentially all coming from the same place yeah totally yeah it's so cool it's like yeah it's it's really really exciting and who's um who is the around at the moment that you would recommend people keep an ear out for Mm. an artist i really love right now is um bella white she um she's a great singer songwriter from canada and she's she's got a bluegrass influence she's got an old school country influence and um she was opening a lot of shows for molly this past year um in the spring and it was just it was awesome to hear her every night um but yeah she's she's wonderful like she just signed with rounder and i think she's going to be a a big thing so definitely check her out cool yeah it's one of the really enjoyable things about um how much stuff is available on social media just in terms of that's almost where you get, I get my news from now. That's my bluegrass newspaper really. So I sit down and sort of check my feet yeah. and see who's doing what and who's talking about who. And mm-hmm. but also to having these conversations, you know, I talked to I think Chris Eldridge first and he said, Oh, you should listen to Wes Corbett. And then, you know, talking to Wes obviously mentioned you and then there's mm-hmm. the names come out and it, it's like just pulling these threads and following and all these names that you've heard and people whose music you've heard, but just putting them in this context of, and everything's so interconnected 
And um, yeah, it's just, just so much good music. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And um, sure. I think one of the interesting things sort of to take it back to the, the beginning bit, um, you sort of started off with the Irish music and, and Cape Breton fiddling, which I presume is a similar, like more along the trad Irish old timey people play the melody together. Kind of music. Yeah. Yeah. Um, keep do, do you still play much of that kind of music? No, I don't play any of it really. Um, yeah, I just, I, I really love it, but I just kind of feel like um, in order to do it justice, it's kind of a full, it, like any style of music, I feel like is kind of a full time thing to, you know, to keep up the repertoire and the feel and everything. And, you know, I've kind of really fallen in love with bluegrass and feel like that kind of I feel like I can express myself more fully playing bluegrass on the fiddle. So I kind of, you know, once I really dove into that, I kind of I felt like I had to leave the Irish stuff fully behind for a while because I, I was trying to change the way I was bowing and all these little subtle things to make it sound more bluegrassy. And every time I would play Irish music, I felt like it would reinforce kind of the old, the old way of playing. And then it just got to a point where then I couldn't really go back. And then I'd, you know, I still remember some tunes and stuff and I could, I could like fake it, you know, I I could play some, but it wouldn't, wouldn't really feel like me. And I wouldn't feel like I had enough repertoire to go sit in a session and play for two hours. You know, I remember maybe, I don't know, maybe like five years ago or something. I was, I was in Dublin and I, I stopped by a session and I was like kind of cocky and I was like, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to go play some Irish music. And I sit down and they're super nice. And then I just, can't remember any tunes you know I just and I just had this realization oh man I'm I'm a bluegrass fiddler now I'm not an Irish fiddler which was like a little bit sad but but also exciting so that's that's what I wanted but I don't you know I don't think I can I I don't think I can do it all no it's funny isn't it because like as an outside as a non-fiddle player I can hear the difference like obviously there Mm -hmm. there are a lot more tunes in in sort of triple time in in Irish music anyway but they they sound like relatively connected styles, um, and yet to hear, to, to hear you talk about the, the sort of the vast difference and how one is is one thing, and even down to technical things like bowing and stuff, um, it, it's that that as a non fiddle player, that side of it um, slightly blows my mind because the idea of adapting your acoustic guitar style from being a sort of more strummy, folky kind of player to playing bluegrass, there's some definite technical stuff you need to understand. Um, but then stylistically feels like where more of the work is where it feels like the fiddle there's a lot of technical difference as well yeah totally and it's it's the kind of subtle things it feels like an accent you know it's like you know it's just a whole it's it's the way you say everything the way you articulate every note or word or whatever and it's it's like it would it would be really hard to switch back and forth between two accents you know you kind of would just have to pick one and if you were going to try to change your accent it would take a lot of work and then you would need to to really try to be consistent with yourself you know yeah yeah cool um so another album coming up more gigs with molly is there anything else sort of going on at the moment i would guess that's keeping you pretty busy yeah that's that's basically it that's kind of full time full steam ahead with molly this summer um yeah we've got some really exciting festivals i'm really stoked to play telluride for the first time that'll be really fun um we're doing Delfest fest in a couple of weeks which will be great um i think we're playing at ibma in the fall and yeah so just kind of that's yeah that's that's all that's happening right now I mean, you said that's all. That sounds like a pretty exciting rest of the year. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I'm really, really excited for it. Cool. Well, thanks so much for doing this. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a real thanks pleasure for... talking to you. No, oh, thanks for chatting and thanks for being interested. <laughs> cool that was a lot of fun um i will put a link to various bits in the show notes do go and buy bronwyn's album fiddler's pastime uh, it's just fantastic yeah i'll put a link to that on bronwyn's website um i'll also link to molly's site for molly tuttle tour dates and yeah i'll put a link into bella white we can all go and listen to her as well um great back again next week with more have a great week happy picking Bluegrass Jamalong is proud to be sponsored by Collings Guitars and Mandolins, making some of the finest guitars and mandolins in the world since the 1970s. Visit collingsguitars.com and find out why.